He is worthy of it all, is he not? Uh, one of my favorite times on Sunday mornings is uh, getting to worship all, all of you guys. Um, there's, a, there's a passage uh, in Revelation where we get a picture of uh, every nation, tribe, and tongue worshiping the Lord together. And I think we get a, a slice of that picture here on Sunday mornings when we get to worship together. And it's one of my favorite times that we have together. Um, I'm, if we haven't met, my name is Chris. I'm one of the two Pastor Chris's here on staff. Um, I help out with our youth and young adult uh, programs here, and I'm just so honored uh, and uh, thankful to be in your guys' presence to give you guys the word this morning. Uh, just a little bit of a caveat. Chris will be back next week. Don't worry. Um, but I don't walk around as much as Chris does. He walks around. He paces around. If you know anything about Chris, he loves to do that. Um, I will not be doing that as much. But I do talk a lot with my hands. And so I'm letting you know up front. That way in three minutes, you're not thinking to yourself, what is wrong with this guy? Why does he talk with his hands so much? I know it's a problem. I need to fix it. It's just, it just helps. I don't know what it is. But uh, we're going to be looking at Daniel 3 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, um, if you want to turn and flip open to Daniel 3, we'll be trying to get through the entire chapter this morning. So go ahead, lock in your seatbelts. We'll get through it. I'm going to break it up in some different chunks. Uh, but uh, it's going to be a great time in Daniel this morning. And I love that we're going through this series of Daniel. We're talking about how Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are living amongst Babylon, this chaos in their world. And they're trying to figure out what does it mean to have faith amidst uh, the Babylon, and what does it look like to have wisdom in the midst of it all. And so I love that we've been going through this, and we're going to learn today for us what does it mean to have wisdom and to seek God, to be faithful to the things that God has for us as we live among Babylon today. So we're, again, we're going to just jump right in. Daniel 3, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. He set up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. And then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So I want to start off this morning by talking about the statue, this idol that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And we probably believe it's mostly made out of wood, probably covered around some gold. Uh, but there is a discernible link between King Nebuchadnezzar's dream that he has in Daniel 2, where we left off, and the beginning of Daniel 3 that we find ourselves here today. And so the king establishes, and he wants these people to know the dream that he had and to interpret that dream. And so Daniel goes to God with these requests. He seeks God and his friends. They pray about it, and God is actually faithful to reveal the dream and and its interpretation. So Daniel goes to the king with this, and he begins to say this in Daniel 2.31. He says, Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. And so Daniel goes on to just talk about this statue and its significance, and he talks about how the head is made out of gold, and then each other parts of the statue is made out of other materials. Uh, but he focuses mostly on the head of gold, and he talks about ki the king Nebuchadnezzar. He says, this is your kingdom. It's great and mighty. In fact, the kingdoms that are coming after yours will be inferior to your kingdom. I'm sure the king loved to hear this at that moment. But Daniel also goes on to talk about there will be a kingdom that comes and destroys all other kingdoms that were known, and it will be here for all of eternity. And we know that that is God's kingdom. But in the midst of this, between uh, Daniel 2 and Daniel 3, and somewhere along the lines, the king, with a little bit of pride and forgetfulness, builds this statue of, of entire gold, almost to say that his day of reign and authority would never end. Right, this was in a direct contradiction to God's declared plan that we see from Daniel chapter 2. Actually, God is using king, the king Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians for his will to point back to his glory, which we'll see later on in Daniel. 
So we have this idol, and then the king actually has all of these people come to the dedication of this idol. And for the king, this is to see their loyalty, to see if these people are loyal to the king and will accept the God that he has made uh, to, to worship and praise. And for the Babylonians, this is just a normal thing. They actually worship many, many gods throughout Babylon. To add another god was just a normal rhythm of life, especially for these people who are part of his kingdom, that were helping him in his land. And so they were definitely going to accept this idol because they had position, they had power, and they wanted to keep their power. And now again, this is a lot of people spread out through his entire, uh, his entire kingdom. It's a great kingdom that he has built, and he brings like probably hundreds of people here to this dedication. This would be kind of similar to uh, anyone who falls underneath the United uh, Kingdom crown coming together for a ceremony to hear about what the king has to say. And so they're here, uh, and all of these officials are in prominent positions throughout the kingdom. And if you've been following along the last couple of weeks, we had talked about how Daniel being faithful to God and finding favor in God has also found favor in the eyes of the king. And so Daniel is actually in a prominent position within King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. But if you've ever read this chapter before, or spoiler, if you haven't read this chapter before, Daniel is not mentioned once in this entire chapter. I don't find it interesting, the entire book is named after Daniel, but yet Daniel is nowhere to be found. It's almost like, where's Waldo? We can't, we can't find him with the little lines. Um, but because we don't know where Daniel is or what he's up to, there's a couple things that uh, scholars of Scripture kind of debate of what Daniel is up to or doing. And so there's two that I want to share with you this morning. The first is that maybe Daniel was out on another assignment throughout Babylon. He just wasn't there during this time. The king has sent them on a mission to do something else throughout his kingdom, so he wasn't there uh, for this. And the second one is that maybe Daniel, because of his place in the royal court, actually didn't have to partake for some reason in this idol worship, in this dedication for this idol. Now again, we're not sure where Daniel is or what Daniel's up to, but I don't want you to miss the most important part of this chapter this morning. In fact, I want to give you the end right here at the beginning, which is that God is faithful. See, this, it's not about Daniel, but it's actually about God. And the entire scripture is not about the various people that you see or read about, but it's actually about God and him being faithful in the midst of those people's lives. It's about God and him interacting with his people, calling them to do what he asked them to do. And all along the way, we see that God is faithful. It's going to be a common theme that we see even here in this chapter this morning. And so we have this picture of the idol, this dedication of the people, um, and then we are told that the people, when they hear the music, are told to worship this idol. And so music is an essential part of the cue and response to worshiping of the idol, which is going to be important for us here in just a moment. Now, if you're here the last couple of weeks, we talked about how Babylon for us today is the culture in which the world, or is the culture of the world in which we live today. Or more easily said, Babylon equals our culture. And while we might never be faced with the same reality of bowing down and worshiping an idol, there are many things that culture wants us as Christians to bow to. And to give you just a running definition of what is idol worship, idol worship is anything that takes the place of God. Anything that takes the place of God is idol worship. And the most common idol worship that I see in our culture today is this thought pattern or idea of it's about me, myself, and I. Many people have what I like to call main character syndrome. They believe they're the main character of their lives and everything else revolves around them. It becomes about what's convenient to me. It's about my comfortability. It's about building my significance here on earth. And while this might be the most common thing worshipped in our culture today, again, anything that takes the place of God is idol worship. Even things that aren't inherently bad in themselves. Things like your job, your positions, your possessions, your kids, your grandkids. Again, anything that takes the place of God, anything that's number one in your heart is idol worship. And here's the thing, when you play the game of Babylon, you'll recognize that you are celebrated by those who live among Babylon. Uh, there's a saying that, I, I don't know if you've heard this growing up or not, but you know, play stupid games and win stupid prizes, right? And that is the Babylon world. And to play their games, you are celebrated by those among Babylon. And so just like there was music to cure the worship back then, to the idol worship back then, there are cues that are happening today that are telling you to bow and when to bow. Like the pressure from your boss to, to perform, which leads to sacrificing your character to make a sale and look good in the company's eyes. 
or the opportunity of making more money, receiving more accolades, getting more recognition, that you fill your schedule so busy that you don't have time to take care or serve others. Or the feeling of becoming uncomfortable that you step away from what God is calling you to do to stay in your comfortable bubble. Do you feel the pressure of culture creeping in that is telling you to bow? See, it's important for us as Christians to recognize and identify the idols in our life, what is taking the place of God, but it's also important to identify the factors that lead to the cueing of putting the idol before God. Now, I remember the first time I experienced this tension of our culture and my faith while working in a job in my junior, senior year of high school. Um, I I work for a large retail store. Um, I don't want to give you guys the name just because they're still around. They still uh, are selling stuff, and I don't believe all of them were like the ones uh, that I worked for. Uh, But I worked in the men's section of this retail store. I was helping people find products, helping them check out the register, putting things back, really anything that the store needed us to do. Uh, But a major part of my job was actually getting people to sign up for credit cards. And so we actually had a quota that they wanted us to meet personally, but also for the store for us to meet in these credit cards. And I was like, you know what? Yeah, I can do that. I can get people to sign up. That's an easy deal, right? And we actually had incentives to get people to sign up. Actually, we were celebrated by the company if we were to do that. And uh, one of the ways they did that is once you got a sale, you basically you'd go on a radio, you would say like a code word, and it was actually the expectation of all the other departments to celebrate that person there in that moment. So you make you feel good, pat on the back. Uh, but the second thing they did was a $5 bonus to your paycheck. Now listen, I know with inflation these days, $5 is nothing. I know, I know. But to a junior and a senior in high school who's making $7.25 an hour at the time, $5 was amazing. I will take it every day of the week, especially when you think about how many people would come up to a cash register within an hour. Where I had the possibility and opportunity to make almost triple my hourly wage just by getting people to sign up for credit cards. I was about it. I was all for the $5. Um, But we're getting ready for uh, an opening one Saturday morning, um, and our manager has this meeting with us, and we're just getting grilled, honestly, from this manager. We're missing quota. We're not projected as a store to even hit quota. She's like, you need to make up the ground so the the gap isn't as big. And so as she is grilling us, telling us to get people to sign up for cards, she says something along the lines of, you know the type of people you can get to sign up for credit cards. And And then begins to give some examples of taking advantage of vulnerable people. And that just didn't sit right with me. That seemed opposite to what I've been learning about taking care of people from the Bible. And so I had a decision to make. I wrestled with it hard. Right? The $5 actually did mean a lot to me as a junior and senior in high school, but it didn't, it didn't mean as much to me as people at the end of the day. And so I no longer intentionally tried to sell their credit cards. And again, the company made it easy to try to sell their credit cards. Like, get 20% off of your purchase today if you sign up for a credit card. And I no longer even offered people that. I was just like, I'd ask. They say, no, cool, good to go. Go on your way. Because again, for them, it was about money. But for me, I saw the people. I didn't want to take advantage of people. And so as a result, my manager began to schedule me less and less. I was hitting quota. I was not hitting quota really ever. Um, and so I didn't get to work a whole lot outside of when another manager scheduled me during his shifts because he didn't really care about quota, and I got to work with him. Um, but through this job, I got a firsthand experience about the pressures that culture can place on people to bow down to things, which results to the sacrificing of my beliefs, integrity, and character. And culture is doing the same thing throughout. Just like Babylon had many gods to bow to, there are many things in our culture today that want you to bow, want you to sacrifice your beliefs. Because they think that whatever their God is more important than the one true living God. So we're going to look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's story and what they did in the midst of their uh, trial. And we're going to be picking up at verse 8. <clears throat> At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Notice how they're softening him up right here. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of province, or province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. 
And so we see from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that they really just have some haters. These astrologers are hating on these guys. That's a, that's a term, a Gen Z term, just so you know. You're welcome for that. I'll throw another one up here in a minute. Uh, they have some haters, though, and these astrologers, with their deep jealousy, I'm sure we're looking at any and every opportunity to make these, look, these guys look bad. I'm sure they're thinking, who are these young Jewish guys coming in here and receiving favor from the king? And so when they saw the opportunity that these guys were not worshiping the idol that the king had set up, I can already see them rubbing their hands together, plotting behind their back, getting ready to go to the king. But I want us to notice the actions of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because their actions weren't really public, but they also weren't hidden either. They weren't public in the sense that they didn't lodge a protest in the midst of this idol worship. They didn't try to make themselves as a victim. But they just operated in their positions that God had put them in and simply refused to uh, bow down to the idol in their lives. And it was also apparent to their coworkers that they worshiped a God, but not the gods that they had. They worshiped the one true God. And it was apparent to even these coworkers. And so they would not allow themselves to have the outward expression of bowing a knee to this idol because it meant more to them in their faith than anything else. Because right? if, we, if we were in a culture like they were and we were told that we'd have to bow or die, I'm, I'm thinking most of us would probably bow and be like, God, you know my heart. Like I'm, you know, I don't want to bow to these things. I don't believe in these things. But there was something foundational with their faith that didn't even allow them to have the outward expression of worship. And it was inherently apparent to the guys they worked with. They refrained from this idol worship, which again is a common theme we even see from Daniel 1, where they refrained from the food that, of the royal court at that time. All right, jumping back into verse 13. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true? Say, is it true? Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, say but. But even if he does. All right, if you see a but in scripture, I'm talking about B-U-T, let me back up. I don't want to get myself in trouble. I don't want to get myself in trouble, but if you see a B-U-T, this actually might be your cue to get your butt up and get a highlighter. All right, this is a defining, this is a defining moment for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And a lot of times when we see these, these are defining moments even for us in our faith. And so when you see a B-U-T, just know that there might be something that's a defining moment for them and for you. Uh, but even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, it's one thing to make a stand for God, but it's a greater thing to stick with that stand when asked pointly, is it true? Is it true that you won't do X, Y, or Z because you are a Christian? Culture is asking us this question over and over again. Is it true that you won't do blank because you're a Christian? And it meant something to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right, we can imagine the enormous pressure on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to compromise everything in front of them, the king, the furnace, the music, their competitors, all of it trying to convince them to compromise. And yet, God was more real to them than any of those things that they could see with their physical eyes. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did what many kids today called stood on business. There you go. There's your second term for this week. They stood on business. If you have teenagers, if you work with teenagers, I challenge you to use this this week, maybe if you're going through the story, to stand on business. Uh, but I will say, you're going to get one of two responses if, if you use it. Either they're going to think you're the coolest person ever, or they're going to roll their eyes at you and sigh. That, that's just how it goes. That happens to me every Wednesday. Our students don't even recognize I'm a part of their generation too, and yet they still think I'm old. So, you know, it, it's a lose-lose situation, but I'm trying to help you guys. I'm trying. Um, but for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they did stand on business when it came to their faith. Right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they chose faith over favor. 
They, they chose faith in what they know to be true of God over the favor from the king that they could receive. But the king said, if you bow just right now, as the music's going off, bow right now, you are good to go. Good thumbs up, you know, a gold star. You can keep your lives, your jobs. But if you do not, you know the consequences of that. And in the face of those consequences, they boldly said, we serve our God. They chose faith over favor from the king. And we see later on as we read in the story that when they choose faith, they didn't receive favor from the king, but they actually received favor from the king of kings. And I love this phrasing that we see in verse 16, that we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Because how often do we try to defend ourselves? How often do we try to apologize for our faith? So we shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel or what scripture calls us to live out. And how often are we trying to defend God like he even needs our help in doing so? For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't defend or apologize for their faith before the king. They were abundantly clear that they would not bow. And when they declared that God would and could deliver them, they recognized that God ultimately held the power that God could deliver not only from the furnace, but from the king's hand. Again, this is a bold statement to say in front of the person that holds the power for your life and death in that moment. And yet they still chose faith over favor from the king. They knew that they must do what was right, even if God did not do what he expected them to do. And even as they say, uh, but even if God doesn't save us from this, they understood that they were supposed to live in submission to the will of God for their lives that that meant more to them. All right, let's read the story out. The Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of his strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of God's. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. For no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Pretty incredible, right? We see a king, he gets mad at these guys, and he turns up the fire seven times hotter than it normally ends. The strongest soldiers of his army bound and tie these guys up, take them up to this furnace, and as they're pushing them in, them themselves actually die from the heat of the fire. And I find it so interesting that the guys stay in the midst of the fire, Right, they're unbound, the fire's still brewing around them. They're walking around in the fire, unharmed, and yet they stay in there. Because if it was me and I was bound, unbound, I recognize I wasn't harmed, there was fire around me, I would not be walking around, I'd be running straight for the way that I came back in. There would be no doubts about that, right? I would not be sticking around to see what happens next. I would be running. But something that we learn from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is that obedience leads to opportunity. Do you know the first opportunity, opportunity they received because of their obedience to God? It led them to the furnace and the fire. Just because you're faithful to God or you're obedient to God doesn't mean you won't experience the fire in your life. And in many cases, living among Babylon, you might experience the fire often because of your obedience to God. But do you notice the other opportunity, opportunity that comes out of their obedience? 
the opportunity for the people of Babylon to recognize that there is only one true God who is able to sustain people in the fire no matter how hot it is. Your obedience to God may show those around you who live among Babylon who the one true God is. A God that loves them deeply. A God that wants them to come back to him. A God who can radically change their lives forever here on this earth, but also for eternity. That is the God. That's the opportunity we have through being obedient to the things of God while living among Babylon. Michael, you guys can come back out. Now, I recognize this morning that some of you might find yourself in the fire right now. You might be in a season where you are in the furnace. You've been faithful to God, doing your best to live in his will for your life, living out your faith, trusting his promises, but you're still faced with situations that make it feel like you're in the fire. And you might be at a place or a moment where you're asking or thinking, where are you, God? Again, I, don't, I wanna highlight that being faithful doesn't protect you from the fire. It didn't for these guys. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego might not even been aware that God's presence was with them in the fire. We actually see that King Nebuchadnezzar is the one that sees the fourth man in the fire. And he's the one that calls them out. And whether we recognize it or not, within our trials, God is there nonetheless. He is always in the midst of our lives. And just like these guys went in, bound, and walked away free, you might be in a season of refinement by the fire, which leads to your freedom. You entered bound to something and came out in a new sense of freedom. Because I don't know about you guys, but I've learned more about what it means to have faith in some of the worst parts of my life. I've grown the most in my relationship with Jesus through the fire and have come out the other side grateful for God showing up and for him being faithful through it all, as he always is. The last thing that we see and learn from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is that they trusted in the faithfulness of God because God is faithful. And I don't know where you find yourself at today, whether that's in the midst of the fire that's all around you and these tough trial situations you're walking through, or maybe you're the person that feels the tension between culture and your faith and you're trying to decide what to do. You're tiltering back and forth what Babylon wants you to do and what God wants you to do. Or maybe you just live among Babylon. Maybe you walked into this church this morning expecting something this morning. You just came off the street, never been experienced to church, or maybe this is your second time ever coming to church. Uh, There's an invitation for all of you this morning. The invitation for those of you that might be living among Babylon, you've been playing the game of Babylon, you've been seeking stuff out, but it's not cracked up as Babylon says it is. You still have a hole in your heart, an H-O-L-E, but you want to be whole, W-H-O-L-E, And there's only one thing that can fill you, that can be satisfied, that gives abundant life, and that is Jesus. It's your invitation this morning. It's just to say yes to him. Begin that conversation. Begin that relationship with Jesus, recognizing that you need a savior, that you no longer want to play the games of Babylon. Now, if you're the person that finds yourself in between the tension of Babylon and your faith, your invitation today is to seek God's wisdom. It takes wisdom to make the right decision, the decision that God wants you to make amidst and living among the chaos of Babylon. God might actually have put you in your positions and your seats in life for you to be a witness for those around you, for those people to know the one true living God. And also be bold in your faith. Be bold in your faith in the places that you are at. Allow that to be an opportunity for someone to know Jesus. If you're in the fire this morning, your invitation is to continue to seek after God. Ask him to reveal himself to you. Ask him maybe what is he trying to teach you through this season and now I recognize that there might even be some trials that aren't delivered here on this earth. That's a reality, unfortunately, that we live in. But hold on, don't lose hope to Jesus. Know that there is something coming that you're not bound forever to your trial, to the fire, that actually God wants to deliver you ultimately, whether that's here on this earth or beyond. God has a plan and a purpose for your life, and he's faithful all the way through. So we want to be reminded this morning of God's faithfulness by taking communion. So if you have a cup, you should have received one as you walked in this morning. It's got these two little pieces. Go ahead and tear the top piece off for me and get that wafer out. 
So while Jesus is talking about uh, these elements with his disciples, um, he says at one point, each time that you do this, each time that you take and eat, remember me. Do this in remembrance of me. And so I want you just to take a moment and just be reminded of God's faithfulness in your life. Be reminded of God's faithfulness even to go to the cross willingly to die for you. Just take a moment by yourself to remember God's faithfulness. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he he got his friends around, his disciples, and he's in a room, and he takes the bread, and he gives thanks to God for the bread, and he breaks it, and he gives it to his disciples, and he says, this bread represents my body broken and given for you. Go ahead and take and eat that way for me. And in the same way, he took the wine that he had, he gave thanks to the Father, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, this wine represents my blood, which was shed for the multitude of sins, even our sins today. To go and take the juice. Would you join me as we pray? God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the ways that you're moving, even in the midst of our culture and among Babylon. God, you are still a God that's a God at work. But we thank you for your faithfulness in our lives, for the faithfulness for you to even still be willing to take the plan to go to the cross and to die willingly for us, to receive new life, to be in right relationship again with the Father. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, would you continue just to to give us wisdom as we navigate through Babylon? Would you continue to direct our steps? Would you continue to help us live out our faith boldly for those who live among Babylon so their lives can be radically changed forever too, Lord? Lord, I know that you have a plan and a purpose, even for this generation, Lord. Continue to move, continue to work, continue to just reveal yourself to us, Lord. We give you all honor and glory and praise, Jesus. It's your great and mighty name we pray. Amen.